One of the oldest known sacred forms in India is the stupa. It is seen in Buddhist and Jaina monuments from early times. Recent excavations near Nalanda have also unearthed a large mud stupa of the 8th to the 10th century BC. In 483 BC, Gautama Buddha attained Parinirvana, the final escape from the illusions of the material world. His followers divided his mortal relics and enshrined them in the heart of mud stupas which were made. Thus began a tradition which spread to many countries and continues till today. Later stupas housed the remains of other great teachers, their personal belongings and also Buddhist texts. In the 3rd century BC, Emperor Ashoka is believed to have retrieved the Buddha's holy relics and enshrined them again in stupas which he constructed across his kingdom. The rule of the Mauryas was followed by that of the Shungha dynasty in the 2nd and 1st centuries BC. The Shunghas worshipped Brahmanical deities and were benevolent to the Buddhist Sangha. The earliest body of Buddhist art, with images of the life of the Buddha and the Jataka stories, was made under their rule. Around 100 BC, a great stupa was made at Bharhut in the eastern part of present-day Madhya Pradesh. Between the sacred and unadorned form of the stupas and the mundane world beyond were made Vedikas or railings and Toranas or gateways. The railings create a path for the devotee to walk around the revered stupa. Forms of the world around us were made on the railings and gateways. Their representations help us to appreciate all forms of life in their true perspective, to see them as reflections of the formless eternal truth towards which we must proceed. Beyond the railings and gateways is the stupa, to point out the truth towards which we must strive, leaving behind the attractions and attachments to the world. The nine-foot-high Vedika and the Torana are made in imitation of the wooden architecture of that time. This is the earliest stupa railing to have survived. Unlike the imperial art of the Mauryas, inscriptions here show that the relief and figures were donated by lay people, monks and nuns. Images of yakshas and yakshis come to us from times immemorial. These embody the spirit of nature and serve to remind us of the divinity which underlies all that is around us. They represent the protection of nature and its great fertility, which ensures the continuance of life. On the left of the north gateway of the Vedika is made the Yaksha Kubera, who symbolizes abundance. On the same pillar is made the Yakshi Chandra. She holds a branch of the Ashoka tree above her. The tree longs for the touch of a beautiful woman to then burst into blossom. She entwines herself like a creeper around the trunk of the tree. The deity of prosperity and abundance, Lakshmi, is also made on the Vedika. This is the earliest image of the deity, who is later seen in the stupas of Sanchi and in other Buddhist art. 
Lakshmi is also a popular deity in other Indic traditions. The whole of existence is seen as deeply connected. All that is around us is a part of the greater one. Therefore, the artists see no problem in joining different forms of plant, animal or human life in a fully harmonious depiction. As the worshipper goes around the stupa, stories made on the railings remind him of the virtuous qualities of the Buddha. Jatakas, or tales of the previous lives of the Buddha, are used to exemplify the rules of conduct in everyday life. We are constantly aware of the cosmopolitan world in India at that time. A pillar of the Vedika has a depiction of a Greek warrior. On another railing, we see a Nagaraja, a serpent king. He is in human form, but has a serpent's hood. Like Yakshas and Yakshis, Naga deities serve to keep us conscious of the power, the protection, and the fertility of nature. Serpents appear in Indic art from the Indus Valley times till today. Many of the roundels in the Vedika have lotus medallions. Human figures are also made within these. In Indic thought, the lotus is a symbol of purity and of rising above the mundane, of transcendence. The Vedika relief depict many scenes from the life of the Buddha and from his previous lives. The Buddha is himself never depicted in this early Buddhist art. Instead, there are symbols which indicate his presence. One of the remarkable aspects of early Indian art is that the focus was not on individuals, and there were no portraits, even of kings. In fact, in the Chitra Sutra of the Vishnu Dharmotra, it is the eternal themes and not personalities which are the befitting subject of art. The focus in the art of the early stupas is on the ethical message. It is this ethical message which is contained in the Jataka stories made on the Vedika of the stupa. One of the marvellous aspects of the art of this period is that sublime character, rare even in humans, is presented in the sculpted animals of the Jataka stories. This is a view of the world which makes no distinction between the life of man and that of the animals and even plants and trees. The city of Vidisha was on the trade route which connected the plains of the Ganga to the western coast. It was also a great marketplace at the centre of the vast and fertile plains of central India. At Sanchi, on a low hill close to Vidisha, are the finest surviving early Buddhist stupas. Halfway up the hill, is a stupa which contains the remains of prominent Buddhist teachers of the Maurya period. The Vedika made around the stupa dates to around 100 BC. The Vedika has medallions and half medallions with reliefs. Corner pillars at the entrances are fully carved. The deity of prosperity and abundance, Lakshmi, is here being lustrated by elephants who pour water over her. 
The relief is shallow and the style is similar to that of Bharhut. The greatest surviving Buddhist stupa of the BC period is on top of the hill at Sanchi. It is likely that it would have enshrined the relics of the Buddha. The stupa was originally made in the 3rd century BC. There is an Ashokan pillar at the southern entrance of the stupa. In the middle of the 2nd century BC, the stupa was doubled in size and its older wooden railings were replaced with massive stone ones. By the end of the 1st century BC, the Satavahanas, kings of the Deccan region, extended their rule to central India. They worshipped Brahmanical deities. However, major stone renovations here during their time made this stupa one of the most significant of all Buddhist monuments. Four gloriously carved stone toranas, 34 feet high, were made. They were completed in the first century AD. The traditions of art established in the time of the Shungas achieved greater sophistication in these magnificent toranas. Six hundred and thirty-one inscriptions on the Toranas tell us that the carvings were the donations of the people of Vidisha. The art was created for gardeners, merchants, bankers, fishermen, housewives, householders, nuns and monks. Almost half the donations were from women. The massive Vedikas are plain and without carvings. The sculpted Toranas have two upright pillars, which support three horizontal bars or architraves. The West Gateway has dwarves who support the finely carved bars of the Torana. The dwarves, or gunners, are made with rolls of fat and vast bellies which bulge over their dhotis. They have individualized facial expressions. Gunners continue as a favorite theme of the Indian artist in the centuries to come. They deepen the sense of the reality presented in art, where the humorous and the sublime coexist, reminding us that everything has its place in existence. The veneration of nature's fertility and abundance, as seen at Bharhuth, continues here. Twenty-four auspicious women are made as bracket figures on the gateways. On the east Torana is a beautifully made yakshi who holds the branch of a mango tree above her. The notion of the creative vitality of nature and its fruitfulness is convincingly portrayed here. As at Bharhuth, we pass guardian figures or dwarapalas at the entrances. One figure is in Indic garb, a dhoti and turban. Another wears Greek garments and carries a foreign type of shield and spear. The reliefs on the Toranas bring us the Jatakas of the Buddha's previous lives, as well as events from the life of Gautama Buddha. The setting of the stories richly reflects the lives of the towns and villages at the time when the art was created. The Sanchi reliefs are the most important visual record of the architecture and lifestyles of the period. The focus is still not on the personality of Gautama Buddha. Buddhahood is still represented by symbols. 
the wheel represents the first teaching of the Buddhist Dharma. The Bodhi tree represents enlightenment, while footprints and an umbrella over a vacant space proclaim the presence of an enlightened one. The Toranas of the Stupa Sanchi present a view of the overflowing activity of life. Whereas the figures at Parhuth were single ones, those here are in large groups. They are in a variety of poses and in the midst of exuberant life. They are no longer depicted only frontally. Instead, three-quarter profiles are also seen. The Sanchi artist depicts a wide range of expressions effortlessly. The great stupa at Sanchi has an inscription on the eastern gateway, which mentions that the exquisite carvings on the gateways are the work of ivory carvers of Vidisha. Indeed, the stone is so finely carved here that it reflects the care and detail of work on delicate ivory. Another stupa at Sanchi contained the relics of the Buddha's close disciples, Modgiliana and Sariputra. The one toran here was made under the rule of the Satvahanas in the first century AD. As in the earlier stupas, here is a vision of the world which sees the unending rhythm in all of creation. The vine of creative blossoming moves with a pulsating life through the Vedika. It brings to us life in many forms, flowers, fruit, animals, humans, and mythical creatures. In the meantime, great caves were being carved out of the hills of the Ghats in western India. Deep within the heart of rock, the seeker was provided a haven of peace, far from the noise and clamor of the material world. Oh God.